Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Advances in Autism Research and Care webinar. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I am Megan Eves, and I am hosting for the day. I just want to give everyone a reminder of uh, some housekeeping tips. So if you have any questions throughout the call, um, feel free to type those into the questions bar. It should be on the right side of your screen. And if you have any tech problems or questions for me, you can type those into the chat box, um, and I should be able to respond to you as this is going. Um, I am so pleased to welcome our presenter for the day, Dr. Judith Miles. Um, Dr. Miles received a PhD in Mays Genetics from Indiana University and her MD and Pediatric Residency from the University of Missouri in Columbia. She also completed a fellowship in medical genetics at UCLA. Her research focus is to gain an understanding of the clinical and genetic heterogeneity within the autism behavioral diagnosis and use this information to improve diagnoses identify genetic causes and, and guide treatment choices. She has previously worked on projects in the field of biological engineering and her patented <laughs> pupillary light reflect instrument estimates the speed of neural transmission and assesses autom autonomic nervous system function in visual circuits. Currently, Dr. Miles is studying the development and treatment of catatonia, which is recognized as a complication of both autism and just recently Down syndrome. This will be the topic of her presentation today. Take it away, Dr. Miles. Thanks, Megan. Um, well, I'm sitting here looking at a just a screen, not any people, but I'm just assuming that there are going to be people out there. Um, here's my first slide. And the message for the first slide is autism, as most of you know who've been in the field for a while, is continually evolving. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today as Catatonia was something that most of us couldn't even spell 15 years ago. Um, <clears throat> just a little background. Uh, I started in autism work in, we set up our first clinic in 1994 in the DSM-4 uh, era where we had subtypes and we saw the increase in diagnoses go from one in 2,500 to one in 68 children. And this is some work that um, we did here at Missouri showing between 1988 and 1995 the 300% uh, increase in diagnoses of kids with autism between the ages of five and nine. Um, <clears throat> in um, psychology, which was really the home of autism um, uh, research in addition to psychiatry, um, we had really a rediscovery of autism and um, uh, sort of a reformulation by Lorna Wing in England in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, then people in medicine and genetics jumped on board when it was time to think about genes and um, exact uh, mechanisms, not that we've done that uh, as well as we hope to, since we're up to well over 800 different genes. But um, there's really been a huge change from when I started out in 1994 uh, to now in 2019. Um, as a geneticist, a lot of my work was done trying to figure out whether we could come up with some homogeneous subgroups of patients because autism was such a complicated um, diagnosis and a complicated array of symptoms, um, hoping that you know if we looked at the kids who just regressed in their language, would that be a specific group who we could uh, treat differently than let's say the kids that had uh, dysmorphology, for instance. So it's not surprising that now we've got another subgroup and it's the uh, kids with autism that are developing uh, catatonia, and we say roughly 13 to 18 percent. Um, um, and catatonia then has also been an evolving field, uh, first described by uh, Kalbaum in 1848, and it was a motor speech and behavior disorder, and um, really was um, part of psychiatry. And when I went to school, uh, catatonia was a complication of schizophrenia, end of story. Um, and then um, 
with the DSM-4, it became uh, legal to describe catatonia as a specifier for other uh, mental and medical uh, disorders. And it's only been since about 2000 that there's been this huge influx or recognition of all the different disorders that predispose to developing um, catatonia. I'm not going to go in this into all this um, uh, very in, in detail, um, but starting out with the schizophrenia one, but it can be different medications or taking away medication, infections, endocrine, even stress and bullying um, are recognized as uh, triggers for catatonia. And I use the word triggers very generically. Um, and it's not too surprising that the <clears throat> last group to be recognized uh, to develop catatonia are the kids with neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, in 1970, Rutter actually um, um, published that 12% of adolescents with autism had a regression in their language. They developed inertia and intellectual decline, which looking back over his work, uh, he was probably discussing uh, catatonia. Uh, Dirk Doshi um, in 1998 uh, described catatonia and said that it responded to neuroleptics and benzodiazepines. Um, uh, there are a number of other papers, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the work that comes from England. Uh, Lorna Wing um, was really the um, leading uh, um, researcher uh, on catatonia uh, in London. She had a daughter with, um, with catatonia and autism. Um, and she described in her group of about I think about 500 patients, 17% of them developed um, uh, catatonia-like deterioration between the ages of 17 and 50. And it was a marked deterioration, but generally gra gra gradual. Um, stupor was rare and um, symptoms seemed to wax and wane. Uh, they suggested that there was a precipitating stress and they suggested stress reduction therapy. That's pretty much where they still are today in the British Isles. Um, overall though, uh, it's now considered that 12 to 20% of individuals develop uh, catatonia. And we can't really say exactly what it is with one person with autism or one person with a neurodevelopmental disorder uh, that sets them up for developing catatonia. This 12 to 20 percent comes from four international studies. Uh, the group that I've worked with the most are individuals with Down syndrome um, and papers by Dr. Gazi Uden from uh, University of Michigan uh, really sort of set the stage for that for, from her work on catatonia in all types of disorders, including autism. Um, and um, this really sort of opened up the field to look at uh, catatonia developing in Down syndrome. And since that time, we've also learned that um, a whole raft of genetic disorders um, are described as developing catatonia. There's a group in Paris that looks at um, children in a psychiatric setting, and they're doing genetic studies on all of their patients with catatonia and have published a long list of various uh, cytogenetic uh, chromosome uh, deletion, duplication disorders, and specific disease disorders um, associated with, with catatonia. So, you know, once again, it's the neurodevelopmental disorders are the last group to be uh, recognized. Uh, as I always tell people, it's not too surprising because um, I can remember a time when um, with young people with Down syndrome, it really was believed that uh, they didn't get the same psychiatric disorders as the rest of us <coughs> and wouldn't respond to the same medications. 
Um, I'm going to start off by showing you some um, pictures uh, of a young man with uh, autism because he really um, is a good example of, of what we see, though I can say probably not the most um, severe. Uh, he developed, was diagnosed with autism when they lived in Indiana when he was three. He underwent a pretty classical autistic regression at 18 months. But despite that, his um, parents described him as a happy kid, interactive. He loved uh, cars. And when I saw him in September of 2014, uh, he was uh, really quite catatonic. He had a respiratory infection in the spring of 2013 and then regressed. <coughs> he stopped going uh, to school. They took him out of school. He stopped going to the store. He didn't use his iPad anymore. He wouldn't go on a trampoline or swim. Uh, he had motor slowing, uh, freezing in his motor activities, aggression and skin picking. Uh, he'd pull out his pubic hair. Um, he had weight loss, neck tick, sleep constipation, the whole, whole bit. And he had a diagnosis of depression. Well, Lisa Bailey, who is a case manager at Boone County Family Services, saw him in September of 2014 and said, you know, Siobhan looks like he's got catatonia. And I make that point because we're not going to see all of these kids, um, particularly the kids with with autism. He was in a school situation where a teacher that just thought he was obnoxious and um, uh, really was, I would have to say, was almost cruel to him. Um, so if the other people we work with in our communities who are seeing these kids, they're going to be the ones that are picking up catatonia, particularly the speech therapists uh, as well. Okay. I'll show you just some pictures of, of what we see and not go into all the details before. This is Javon's first clinic visit and first clinic visit. Um, and it was Javon with his head down and his hand up in front of his face which is, <laughs> and kicking a kid in a wheelchair. Um, this position with the head down and not looking at people is, is a very common um, um, posture that I see when I see kids when they first come in before treatment. Often I say I don't see what the kids look like until about um, two treat two um, clinic visits later. Uh, in that first clinic visit, we tr give a test dose of lorazepam, and then after that, wait for about half an hour, and um, then go for a walk again to see what the difference is. And here is Javon. Um, over by the bookshelf, and I always take kids over to the bookshelf to pick out something to uh, read. And he's looking much better now. He picked out a book. His dad said, no, probably shouldn't get that. It's in Spanish. And he put it back and got another one. Um, and he's walking much differently. He puts his head down there a bit, but is walking quickly. Uh, he stops to look at Dr. Hall up here, and they exchange a little bit of uh, socialization and goes off with his dad. So we can see that he actually responded to uh, that test dose of lorazepam, which if you've got the symptoms and you respond to that, that's a pretty much a uh, slam dunk for the diagnosis. Um, now we have Javon on lorazepam, walking quickly to the school bus. Um, his mother couldn't get him out the door before, and now he grabs his book back and runs. Um, he walks upstairs without stopping. He likes going to the store. He plays with his cars and plays with the other neighborhood boys. Um, his skin picking has stopped and he's less in, impulsive. Uh, and those are really wonderful things for Javon. Now, one thing I need to point out is that this skin picking, you can see he has scars here. So he really has self injurious behavior. And that's much more common in kids with autism uh, than it is kids with Down syndrome and some of the other neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, he also has 
um, uh, trichotillomania, which is picking out his hair. We treated that with NAC and acetylcysteine, and that really controlled that. Prior to that, the teacher, who was not the least bit sympathetic to Javon, had him in a um, sort of a suit where he couldn't get his hands into his um, pants, and he was kind of bound up. Um, so getting good diagnostic uh, evaluation of everything else and treatment uh, goes a long way as well. I'll show you a little bit more of these, but this just shows the catatonia impact scale that we use to follow over time how kids are doing. So this is starting back in October 2014 and going up to through 2017. Uh, this is the Bush Francis scale, which I'll show you a little bit about. And it's a great scale to make a diagnosis with. And I'll show you some examples of that. It's not quite as good um, or not, not good at following uh, over time. And so we've developed a catatonia impact scale, which is much more sensitive to the small ups and downs. And so we see over time as his lorazepam dose was um, uh, increased, he was put on the NAC for his trico, trico <laughs> can't ever say that word, trichotillomania, um, and he gradually uh, got better. But transferring to, to, to appropriate school was um, just as important. So the point from Javon is that the diagnosis is really easy. Um, this is a syndrome diagnosis. It's done totally on the basis of um, what the young person is doing. Uh, so it's something that geneticists are real comfortable with diagnosing syndromes and people with autism because autism is a behavioral uh, syndrome that we use um, measures for to make the diagnosis. Uh, so the motor activity getting stuck, uh, decreased speech, withdrawal, mood, negativism, stereotypic movements, decreased ability, slow eating and a refusal, and then using this Bush-Francis um, scale. Uh, the onset is generally in adolescents and young adults, but it may be earlier. It's often gradual. Sometimes it's sudden. It's actually more apt to be gradual in neurodevelopmental disorders and autism than it is in psychiatric disorders. Um, and it always comes up with an emergence of new symptoms. So this has to be considered only in um, individuals who all of a sudden have a significant uh, deterioration in their um, uh, condition. It's not something where the parents say, well, he's always been slow and he's never been much of a talker and he's always been a slow eater. It's got to be a change in um, the symptomatology. We see sleep disturbances, which at the beginning are often very um, concerning and just very difficult for families. Incontinence and loss of independent toilet, toileting and all other um, uh, normal uh, uh, personal care losses. They may say they're scared, and I'll show you a picture of a young man saying he's scared, need prompting to do anything. If you don't prompt them, they just sort of stop and go back into their own uh, regression. Um, and the difficulty with autism, uh, sorry about that, but the difficulty with autism and catatonia is there is an overlap in symptoms. But if you're, you know autism and you know catatonia, you can generally sort out the differences in uh, the symptoms. And what we always talk about is, you know, our brain does a number of wonderful things, but it only does so many. And so um, speech, for instance, can be affected by many, many different disorders. Um, rigidity can be affected due to many, many disorders, but um, you know, we say the eyes only do one sort of thing and the ears only do one sort of thing and the brain does things. So you can't just look at lists of things and say, this is in one disorder and this is in another. 
this Bush Francis scale, I have a um, link, computer link that you can get this off our Thompson Center website. But this is the uh, most widely used measure, both clinically and in research. It has high inner rate of reliability, sensitivity, and specificity. It's been validated in uh, many mixed psychiatric and medical um, cause groups of, of catatonia. And you go through these 14 um, symptoms, and if you get two or more that are positive, you think seriously about catatonia. If you get to four, it's just about a slam dunk. So this is, again, the mobility, the mutism, sitting and staring without scanning the environment, sometimes with decreased blinking. Posturing, these are the kids that sit with their heads down when I first see them, or um, will just stand there, sort of what we think of catatonia in the old days as the person who just stands and doesn't move for hours, um, but sitting and standing for long periods. Uh, facial expressions, stereotypic movements, um, repeating different words or phrases, and it's different than generally the echolalia we see so commonly in kids with autism. Negativism, which is really very interesting because the parents really pick up on this. These are kids who used to be easy to get along with. Um, I remember one dad saying, you know, I, I asked him if he would um, bring his dish over to the kitchen and he said no. Uh, so there's this contrariness that develops that's very different. Uh, this withdrawal, refusing to eat or drink or make eye contact. And then you can also have episodes of extreme hyperactivity, um, motor unrest, which is um, um, non-purposeful. There are another um, nine symptoms that we don't count to look at the um, diagnosis but they do get counted as we figure out how severe the disorder is. The ones that are uh, most likely to incur, occur are impulsivity and um, kids that will just all of a sudden take off running, <clears throat> um, take all their clothes off without any provocation. And the getting stuck is a, a um, uh, sort of a bellwether uh, symptom with catatonia. Um, actually, the first I learned about catatonia was at an ATN meeting in California, um, and I can still see the pictures of the young man going up the stairs and just stopping in mid-step and freezing. Autonomic ab abnormalities, which is sort of what leads into malignant catatonia, which we won't go into very much. Flushing seems to be common, uh, inappropriate sweating, all these autonomic nervous system problems. Now I've got some um, videos. Um, Andy's father is a wonderful videographer, so he sent me all of these. So um, Andy's just trying to close the door, something he could do um, effortlessly before. And here he is uh, sitting um, at his desk where he liked to eat. And you note him trying to eat and how slow it is. And it's not surprising that parents will say it takes kids two hours to um, uh, uh, eat a meal. And then the shrugging of his shoulders, um, the motor slowing, When I first saw him in clinic and gave him the lorazepam, two milligrams, um, one of the things that I had ready to see whether he would um, change was um, a drink because he was drinking very, very slowly. And his parents said they could, just couldn't get him to um, you know, drink enough. And so I gave him this drink. I can't remember what it was. And he took it and he slugged down the whole thing and then promptly vomited. So I don't use that as a test anymore. 
And here you see the facial grimaces and the shoulders shrugging and the body ticks. So you hit the camera with it. Oh, it's close, went in the hall, didn't it? You can say the, see the facial movements as well, but also the slowness of his movements. The face is really um, very um, informative. Here you see this young girl here with her um, mother and going out shopping and just looking like she's not, not with the group at all. That was 2013. And then here she is sitting on the floor in their home at 2017, looking, uh, making eye contact and uh, obviously much better. And here's Andy, the one who was so slow. Um, he is a um, pitcher for the Special Olympics and a really good soccer player. So the clinical protocol, and I'm not going to go through this in great detail because it's um, uh, written up both in papers that have come out, but one that we've just submitted as well. You start with a history um, baseline and a timeline um, and do the Bush-Francis scale. Physical exam, it's observation, it's neurologic, and then that two milligrams and I use IV lorazepam as that test dose. And I do this at the first clinic visit, though I've spent a fair amount of time before getting uh, family history forms and health history forms and talking to the parents. Um, and then after that, we do a really a pretty comprehensive medical evaluation because catatonia can occur in so many different disorders. And we know so little about it in the kids with neurodevelopmental disorders that I don't think it's time to just say, oh, it's catatonia associated with autism or catatonia associated with Down syndrome. So we look at immune dysfunction, uh, which is really important with um, in kids with Down syndrome, brain metabolism, intermediary metabolism. Um, because here when we, this is just a relatively short list of all the different disorders that can uh, trigger catatonia. People with renal transplants, one of my ones I think is most informative is women with postpartum depression, uh, which is usually a pretty treatable, short-lived uh, disorder. Um, and it's not unusual for them to develop catatonia. Interestingly, treating catatonia in that population is very fast. I uh, treat with ECT and they get better uh, quickly. Um, whereas our patients with neurodevelopmental disorders, it's a little bit more difficult to treat and takes longer. I'm going to say a little bit about the pathophysiology, but not very much um, because it's, it's all available. The catatonia of the pathophysiology is pretty well worked out. Um, it seems to be an imbalance between the GABA and glutamate neurotransmitter systems. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, glutamate is excitatory, and we end up with uh, too little GABA and too much glutamate, um, and the goal is to increase GABA, and we increase GABA with GABAergic agents, benzodiazepines, ECT are the two main ones. And then there are a whole bunch of others like barbiturates, but barbiturates have a lot of side effects, so you don't want to um, use a lot of barbiturates. Um, ketamine um, is also a GABA agonist, but these are the two standard treatments. And you can also work on de increasing, um, de decreasing glutamate, because glutamate is increased in catatonia. We use Men, um, memantine, amanadine, and the one that we're using now mostly is Nudexa. Uh, dopamine hypoactivity is also associated with catatonia, um, but is not treated as much, so some psychiatrists um, um, use antipsychotics um, to decrease um, or increase dopamine. 
um, that runs a risk of developing malignant catatonia. So our first line treatments are the GABA agonists, high dose um, benzodiazepines, starting with two milligrams a day and going up by two milligram um, uh, increments relatively slowly. And I usually think I'm not going to be going up any further when I get to 25 milligrams a day or when I get up to going up two milligrams twice and I'm not having any improvement in uh, symptoms, you usually say, well, it's time to go on to something else. Are there side effects to lorazepam? Yes, but not much. Uh, you and I, if we take uh, lorazepam, uh, we're going to get sleepy, which is always an advantage if you're using it to go to sleep. Dizziness um, can occur, um, worry about falls in people. But what you see, which is just fascinating, is this sort of um, uh, reverse effect where you give lorazepam to someone with catatonia and they wake up. It's kind of like the same story of a patient with ADHD and treat them with amphetamines. And rather than getting hyped up, they get calmer. So there is this uh, different effect um, in people with catatonia. There are some risks, and the two main risks are going off it quickly. Um, benzodiazepines are anti-seizure medications, and if you just stop them, um, you will often get seizures. And then overdose, and I've seen this a couple of times, I'm sorry. Um, when the kids are getting better and they uh, realize that this is the pill that their mother gives them so they'll feel well, I've had two um, patients um, decide to take them on their own and have had uh, an overdose. Uh, one was a phone call from Hawaii where they were on a vacation, sent them to the emergency room and um, got the antidote from for uh, lorazepam overdose that they didn't find. Modified ECT, uh, this is just to point out that uh, this isn't your grandfather's ECT where ECT was sort of like sticking your finger in uh, the light socket. Modified ECT is um, uh, done in an ambulatory surgery suite with an anesthesiologist, the psychiatrist, a nurse. There's sedation given, this is what we use. Um, muscle blockade uh, with succinylcholine, uh, oxygen, and then a very brief pulse, about four seconds. Uh, we use bifrontal uh, electrodes, uh, which induces a short seizure. Usually, we like to get over 20 seconds. Um, and here is, is just another example of what we see with, with treatment. This was a young man, this is the same young man, um, pre-treatment walking up this um, and he just is very uncomfortable with this just At one point in this, I won't show you the whole thing. He just says scared that he doesn't want to do it. And then this is two days later after we've started him on lorazepam. Wow, Andy. Do it again. Do it again. Um, so you can see a really dramatic uh, effect. He's been on it for um, two days. And ECT, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but there's a lot of um, literature out there on using ECT for catatonia. Uh, it's the standard of care for catatonia, also for a whole bunch of other psychiatric disorders, depression, psychosis, um, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, and it's really uh, efficacious in 80 to 30 percent of people with uh, catatonia. Um, it's safe. Uh, you hear all sorts of scary things about ECT, but 
studies have shown no structural, histopathologic, or cognitive damage with prolonged maintenance ECT. Uh, the stated uh, risk of death is four cases per 100,000. And that's mainly due, and this is for everybody, due to cardiac disease in the elderly uh, and children. There have been no deaths reported. Um, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry has best practice parameters. This is Dr. Ghazi Uden, and she was the lead author on that as well. Um, and the risks are really to the risk, the same risk for any type of short-term anesthesia. Um, and there have been controlled studies of that. But we still have a lot of resistance uh, in the general public and by physicians um, worried about side effects, of memory loss, prolonged seizures. You know, a pro prolonged seizure in a surgery suite with an anesthesiologist there is a very treatable uh, complication. Uh, headaches, nausea, muscle aches uh, after the procedure um which we just don't see very much um, but there are really lack of long-term studies and the biggest problem that we have is that missouri requires court approval for incompetent individuals so for all of our um, patients with neurodevelopmental disorders we have to go to court which is expensive um, parents have to have a lawyer um, so I happen to have a very wonderful lawyer who doesn't charge, charge them. Um, and um, some states, California and Texas, it's even more restrictive, less than the age of 18. Uh, there's a, a book where Dr. Gazian was the uh, main editor of that on electroconvulsive therapy in children and adults. This just is the Missouri law, um, and one of the things that I hope to do is to get down to Jefferson City and see if we can get that changed. Other treatments, uh, glutamate antagonists uh, have been used for quite a while. Some people really like memantine uh, and acetylcysteine, topramax. Um, Nudexa is the newest uh, glutamate antagonist was um, reported by the head of psychiatry in Phoenix and some of his um, uh, adult patients and we've had good um, luck with that as well. Minocycline decreases cerebral inflammation um, and may also be a uh, NMDA receptor antagonist as well. Um, behavioral therapy, um, this sort of goes back to the British um, uh, recommendations to mitigate stressful exposures. Um, uh, on one of the patients I had initially, I uh, told her mother, and this was about five years ago, okay, we're going to try a month with just making stress gone. And, you know, she got worse. Um, so, um, we find that, yes, everybody does a little better if they don't have very stressful activities, but uh, our patients do best when they get to do in activities that they enjoy. But good medical care is, is critical. Um, most of these patients have other disorders that you um, can pick up with a good medical evaluation. Many of them have been missed because the behavioral problems are um, overriding and um, just block every, everything else out of everybody's um, list. The other um, important thing that I think is very helpful is to be able to monitor treatment, to have a team of people ease of access, and we've developed a longitudinal monitoring system that we call the Catatony Impact Scale. It actually uh, follows the autism AIM, autism impact measure, uh, developed um, by Dr. Canny and Dr. Mazurik. And what it is, it's a list of questions, and parents fill out whether in the last week or two weeks, depending on how often they're sending these in, 
um, is the patient immobile? And zero is for never, four is for always, and all of these are scored. We have movements, but they're specific questions. So it's, it's uh, helpful to um, not just ask for a overriding question about movement, but to give examples. And parents were involved in picking out these questions and uh, the wording as well. So we have 23 there. And then um, uh, 32 questions overall. This scale is actually now computerized um, and goes out once a week to families, and they just fill it in totally online. And um, here is an example of uh, one um, reading it, just doesn't go terribly far, but this is from the beginning. And this is the Bush Francis scale again, which is very high uh, for the severity scale and the screening scale. So he had 10 of those 14 um, symptoms at diagnosis. And you start treating, and this is treating with lorazepam. The scores go down dramatically, but then it doesn't tell you very much about what actually is is going on. So that's what prompted us, and he was the first patient that we had that we um, developed this for and we have the frequency of um, symptoms and then their impact on daily uh, living and we see that um, here is a time of getting ECT when he gets ECT then the uh, symptoms gets much, gets much better. Here's another patient uh, who has both autism um, and uh, Down syndrome, and she responded some to lorazepam, um, and um, still was getting more and more symptoms. She had ECT, responded very well to ECT, but as soon as we stopped the ECT, her symptoms went back up. Um, about here is where we uh, learned about Nudexa, uh, started her on that, did ECT with the combination of those. Um, she has is very close to baseline at this point. Another patient never did get ECT. She was very difficult to treat because she, she basically, she wanted to sleep a lot. It was hard to get her medications in. Um, and here were her symptoms up here. And as we went up with the um, lorazepam, she gradually got better. Um, um, we added another medication here and then added Nudexa. I think this was minocycline. She had some um, uh, hepatic disorders. Uh, and um, this is the Nudexa. And she got back to what her father said was above baseline by a year, I guess a year ago, Christmas. Um, and the reason I think she got better than she was before she developed catatonia is we diagnosed her with celiac disease, which was actually quite severe, and treated that. We diagnosed her with a uh, immunologic um, uh, liver disease as well and treated that. So we were doing a lot of different things at once. Uh, and then the most recent patient, uh, Audrey, she had had catatonia for about two months. Um, her mother was a nurse and uh, very diligent in filling out all the forms and doing things and so lazapan went up. By then we'd really gotten hooked on new DEXA. Uh, started that early. Um, she was on that, the EC. She was already getting better. We added the ECT and she has continued on the new DEXA to get better and she's pretty much back to baseline. What's happened over the last five years of working with these kids is um, we've gotten better at what we're doing. Um, we start medications earlier. We don't want to say we're gutsy, but we uh, have experience and we know what to expect. Um, uh, and it, it does show in kids doing better. 
complications of catatonia. I'm not going to go into in detail just to say that malignant catatonia is severe. You get fever, hypertension, um, and uh, even deaths. Kids with catatonia get malnutrition, starvation, dehydration. Uh, disorders of immobility, and there's some patients who will just end up being totally immobile with bed sores. When I look back in my history, which is relatively long of patients who uh, developed catatonia before I even knew what it was, and we never diagnosed them. I had two patients with Down syndrome who went into residential cares and eventually died. Um, after having multiple evaluations by psychiatry and neurology um, and never came up with a reason. So that's a very severe disorder if not treated. So the last question, is catatonia in people with autism different than catatonia in other people? Remember I said Wing and Shaw proposed that there's a disorder called autistic catatonia which was different from catatonia and psychiatric disorders. It was treated behaviorally, and that still persists in the British Isles. Um, the feeling is that this is not uh, appropriate. Uh, Lee Wachtel, I don't know how many of you know her, she's a psychiatrist at Kennedy Krieger, who's one of the um, forerunners in understanding catatonia and people with neurodevelopmental disorders and autism. She has two relatively new papers out that I really recommend. Um, uh, this is the multiple faces of catatonia and autism. And she has her practice in a tertiary care center. And so her um, uh, patients are biased towards uh, very severe patients, and of the 22 patients that she's had over 10 years, 20% have repetitive self-injury. Uh, and um, I can um, identify with that just because of the young man that um, I showed you with his self-injuries. Self and kids with autism tend to also um, be a have a history of uh, more patients with self-injury. All of them met Bush Francis catatonia rating scales and um, responded to ECT. And so she concludes that self-injurious behavior is an under-recognized symptom of catatonia. Um, and I think that may be, um, and I'll give you that caveat later, and then her next paper that just came out was um, the diagnosis and treatment in autism. And what she says is the way you treat catatonia in autism is just the way we treat it in other populations. Uh, they respond somewhat to low doses of lorazepam. This data is, is not as convincing because many of these patients were treated um, before they got to see her and only had very low doses that somebody on the outside said they didn't respond to. So it really wasn't an adequate trial. They all, however, responded to ECT. But the message is that of those 20 patients, she's done a total of um, anywhere from 16 treatments in one patient all the way up to 688 ECT treatments in another patient. And 59% of these 20 patients remain on maintenance CT. And that means ECT maybe once every two weeks, sometimes it's once a month, sometimes it's once a week. And so is catatonia and autism different? Her answer is no, catatonia is an independent medical syndrome. But what we see is that the underlying disorder can influence what you see in catatonia, which I think may be what we're seeing here, the self-injury that we see in a lot of our autism patients um, uh, sort of shines through in the catatonia. In Down syndrome, um, I'll just wait and you can read this paper hopefully when it comes out in a couple of months. Um, again, it's the same story. Um, catatonia is catatonia is catatonia. 
but the underlying conditions can influence the tone, the quality, or the character of some of the symptoms. Um, we have problems to solve. So few people even know what catatonia is when it comes to neurodevelopmental disorders. Autism, I think, is the hardest um, disorder to sort out catatonia in because there is an overlap in symptoms. And the kids with autism, they don't follow a straight course of how they're doing. They'll be doing well, then all of a sudden the bottom will fall out. And so they're sort of up and down, which I find very difficult. Treatment is difficult. Um, the treatment's less, these kids are less responsive to catatonia treatment than many of the psychiatric disorders. Uh, and ECT scares people. I have um, a couple of patients who haven't had ECT because their parents are uncomfortable with it. So in conclusion, Catatonia is treatable, diagnosable, and common. Uh, catatonia neurodevelopmental disorders is catatonia. It's the same disorders you see in people with lupus, encephalitis, depression, schizophrenia. Symptoms may be a little bit different, maybe a little different. So we say it's not your grandfather's catatonia. We say that to the psychiatrist. Uh, the triggers may vary. In Down syndrome, we find that a lot of the um, patients who develop catatonia seem to have more severe immune dysfunction. I'm not sure whether that's a bias of our looking for it. Um, and catatonia is common in teens with kids with Down syndrome and other neurodevelopmental disorders. It's more apt to be chronic in kids with neurodevelopmental disorders and we need advocacy, awareness, and research to um, um, improve what we know, and also uh, ECT advocacy. So I want to thank you. This is our team here. Uh, we have two psychiatrists, psychologists, neurologists, me, and a research specialist, actually two research specialists. We don't have her picture up here. And then finally, uh, these are links to the two scales that I use. And um, we are, this is the one that we've developed. Um, Carrie Noel, one of the psychologists, is working on a paper describing this in more detail. Um, but these, you can go to the Thompson Center website and you upload the Bush Francis scale. And here the Thompson Center website, which is just thompsoncenter.missouri.edu and the CIS for the ATN web webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Megan? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Miles. That was amazing. Um, we did get two questions that I think we ha we'll have time for. Um, one of them is, um, do you have any recommendations for how we can better prepare clinicians and especially community providers to recognize and diagnose catatonia? Oh. <laughs> Question, yeah. Question has any ideas. I'm willing <laughs> to. I think, you know, I think we just have to keep saying it over and over again. And when we see patients um, uh, to get feedback to everybody involved because the patients that I've talked to you about have generally been followed by good neurologists, good psychiatrists, good everybody. And, um, you know, when we come back with catatonia, they go, huh, I never thought of that. And these are, these are good people, some of them here, some of them in the community, some over our shoe. Um, and so the more papers we can get out describing it, the more talks we can give. Um, um, we publish in uh, open access journals um, because parents can get to them. And um, uh, we, through the Down Syndrome group, are setting up a um, list of uh, centers who trying to get some plenty in each state that 
um, is interested in diagnosing and treating catatonia and Down syndrome. And I really would love to encourage the ATN centers to um, take up that gauntlet and um, put together uh, a resource in each of the ATN centers that will diagnose and treat catatonia. Um, and any university center has the resources um, to just pull together the people. They don't all have to be in the same room at the same time. Um, and you may have to beg, borrow, and steal uh, to get some of them to be involved. But um, our, one of our biggest problems is we don't have anywhere to send these kids. Is that a long yeah. answer to your question? <laughs> no, that was perfect. Um, and you actually wrapped in an answer to the next question too. So I think that we'll be able to Close out for the day. Um, I want an extent. I want to extend a sincere thank you, Dr. Miles. That was really wonderful. Um, again, to everyone, thank you for joining. This webinar will be posted on the network YouTube page um, within the next week or so. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.